Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Common Good Project. This is the summer version of the conversation series on what is the common good. We are very pleased to have as our guest scholar today a distinguished champion of public service, the Right Honorable the Lord Hastings of Scarsbrick. As always, thank you to the Faculty of Law, as well as Blackfriars Hall and the Aquinas Institute for hosting this conversation series. We remind those listening today, and especially the students, that in exploring what is the common good in the context of law and society, we have asked our guest scholars to discuss this question from their own perspectives. Lord Hastings experiences in the private and public sector and as a member of the Lords will certainly provide us with much to discuss. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris to introduce our guest. As Ryan noted, today our guest scholar is Lord Hastings of Scarsbrick. Lord Hastings has had a long and storied career as an educator, journalist, television presenter, and now sits as a crossbencher in the House of Lords. Lord Hastings began his career as a secondary school teacher in West London. In the mid-1980s, he began government service focusing on inner city issues and crime prevention. Along with being a leading advisor to the Commission of the Metropolitan Police, he has served on numerous commissions, including for nine years as a member of the Commission for Racial Equality and a member of the Social Security Advisory Committee. Lord Hastings is widely known for his role in journalism. In 1990, he began working on education programming and served as GMTV's chief political correspondent. In 1994, he served as the presenter on BBC Two's Around Westminster and soon began, uh, became the BBC's head of public affairs. In 2003, he served as the BBC's first head of corporate social responsibility. In 2006, he was appointed KPMG's global head of citizenship and served in that role until 2019. He also served on numerous boards, including being a trustee of the Vodafone Group Foundation and the British Telecom's Board of for Responsible, Responsible and Sustainable Business. In 2003, he received a CBE for his many years of uh, commitment to working to improve inner city life and crime reduction, including 15 years as chair of crime concern. In 2005, he was created the Lord Hastings of Scarsbrick by Her Majesty the Queen. As a crossbencher in the Lords, he has served on numerous committees and inquiry, inquiry commissions. He has been active in the World Economic Forum and is a vice president of UNICEF. He has served on the board of Millennium Promise, founded by Jeffrey Sachs. In 2014, he was awarded a doctorate in civil law by the University of Kent. And in 2017, he was installed as the Chancellor of Regents of University London. He, also, uh, he is also the Stephen R. Covey Professor of Leadership at the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. Welcome, Lord Hastings. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Lord Hastings. And uh, I think it's fair to say that you, you stand out among our guest scholars during this series as having had the most varied and diverse roles committed to community. Uh, indeed, global improvement, not just community improvement, but global improvement. And as Chris noted, he barely began to list your accomplishments and and work. Uh, it, it's I think for those who are listening, it's it's well worth. Uh, an internet search to read uh, all that you've done. I, I, uh, I could barely keep up. I don't know how you keep up uh, with this. And, and now you're a chancellor of, 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 a, of a university as well. Um, so with, with a career dedicated to perhaps what I would refer to as social responsibility, and you might describe it in different terms, uh, but I'm happy to hear, I, I will simply ask the starter question from your perspective, what is the common good? Well, I want to read you a little quote, if I can, um, which I hope helps to define my understanding of the common good, and I hope may help us to think about it quite wisely. And here it goes. Um, we make friends by doing good to others, not by receiving good from them. When we do kindnesses to others, we do not do them out of any calculation of profit or loss, we do them without afterthought 
relying on our own free liberality. I declare that in my opinion, every single one of us as citizens in all our, the manifold aspects of life are able to show themselves the rightful Lord and owner of their own person and do this moreover with exceptional grace and exceptional versatility. Now that may sound like a manifesto for a political party seeking the goodwill of the voters, but it was written by Pericles somewhere between 495 to 29, 429 BC. And in other words, we've had a concept of the common good for as long as there have been decades and millennia. We've always been able to think about that which we wish our neighbors would be and that we might be towards our neighbors. We're in constant pursuit of this civil society, this strengthened place where our individual rights to contain and obtain are also balanced by our collective duties to share and to compare so that we can support those with less than we have and enable those who are on the edge of society's realities. So this common good concept is actually as embedded in historic faith and historic philosophy as it is now expressed, probably by the words which I think were so brilliantly ennobled almost by Jesus Christ when he said, you know, seek to do to others what you would wish them to do to you. Treat them like you'd like to be treated. That's the golden rule. And that sense of common good is not a difficult concept to grasp, but it's a hard thing to do. Lord Hastings, I think that's a, that's a beautiful introduction. And what I particularly like is that you've, you've anchored this notion of the common good in, uh, in history, in the sense that th this is, uh, oftentimes we, uh, in my view, have this sense that we are progressing to new ideas that we've never thought of before, when in reality, we find out that uh, humans have uh, have thought of them in many other times, often often in ancient times, uh, but sometimes we forget them. And the, the quote from Pericles that you provide uh, notes friendship, which has been an important theme in this conversation series. We've we've often talked about uh, the common good with our guests from uh, whether it's a policy perspective or a legal perspective or simply a, an anthropological uh, perspective. But one of the things which we keep coming back to is that uh, however we might be seeking the common good, it is rooted in friendship, something which it, 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 it sometimes seems a little strange to modern ears, but at the end of the day, it, it, it does seem to have this connection as friendship. Um, I, I know this might be a little bit off topic, but, but could you discuss a little bit just your thoughts about friendship on an on a individual, local, and perhaps even a global level? Well, I'm glad you asked me that because I was actually asked about that very issue this week twice, hmm. uh, in this week that we're having this conversation. And I was asked about uh, complex people who'd had to learn to become friends. And I gave the example of someone I had to interact with quite a lot in my political journalism days, who was Ian Paisley. Now, there is an Ian Paisley MP now in Northern Ireland, but it, this is his father, the famous Ian Paisley, the Reverend Ian Paisley, a, a grandiose figure, a big man of strident opinions. And of course, in his day, to have been associated with Sinn Féin or as some would see it, the IRA basically under a political mask was absolutely completely the worst of all conceivable ideas. But when he faced up to how do we deliver peace in a constructive way for Northern Ireland and came off the fence of everybody who is a Roman Catholic or everybody who's associated with Sinn Féin, the political party has to be a terrorist and built a friendship with Martin McGuinness, now very sadly, past, they became joint first ministers of Northern Ireland and were the first ones to implement the Good Friday Agreement, which had been devised effectively under the premiership of, of the British Prime Minister John Major and then put into effect by 
Tony Blair. And therein lies another example of where what was clearly, some would say, is a conservative approach to peacemaking in Northern Ireland was fulfilled by a Labour government. But Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley found friendship. And in finding that wonder of friendship in the same way that F.W. de Klerk, president of South Africa, found friendship with Nelson Mandela, the black imprisoned 28 years behind bars. And when F.W. de Klerk let him out, as it were, and they began the conversations towards the transfer of power between white minority rule and black majority rule, probably one of the most beautiful things, and very few people have really clocked this one, is that F.W. de Klerk, who's still alive today, and I count him as a good friend, that he, he made the choice as president to serve under Nelson Mandela, to serve under him, so to serve with him as vice president. And that meant that in their friendship, they could focus on the governance of South Africa to bring what was a white dominated civil service, military establishment, police establishment, legal establishment into line with a black majority political establishment. So these great friendships in places of conflict show us that if they can do it, we can do it. This is all about, are we willing to reach across the aisle as they'd say in the United States, endlessly in, in the House of Representatives or in the Senate, reach across the aisle, find the other person and take them on the journey with you. One of the things that I have been involved in very recently, in fact, literally just a week ago, second time uh, ongoing, is a reverse mentoring program inside a major lifers prison. And I won't name the prison, but I will say this, this is a black majority held prison where the officers are white with one or two exceptions. And what we are doing is helping white officers who of course are quote in charge to develop friendships with black insiders, prisoners, inmates, however you see it, in order that out of that friendship, instead of there being conflict and control, this understanding and relationship. And that breaks down these walls of superiority and distance. Now, some people might say, oh, come on, why bother seeking to be friends with those who are criminally charged? Well, because you have to live with them. I mean, people are much more likely to work with us if they like us. So if we have active friendships be between even those held and those who are doing the holding, well, then we're more likely to get a better atmosphere and good results and recovery of good character than if it's constant conflict. So we can look anywhere we like in the world. Where there has been friendship, there is freedom. And where there's the absence of friendship, we make judgment and discrimination. I, I think those points are, are, are so, uh, first off, this, this very eloquent discussion of friendship and perhaps uh, one of the most uh, uh, practical points on friendship that that we've we've been encountered in our conversation because it, it in my takeaway on your your remarks uh, are, are two one is that oftentimes when people are thinking about the common good or trying to better society uh, we, we might think that we are uh, too distant from the powers of, of uh, the lovers of power and the ability to affect change when it uh, it might seem, uh, a, a bit, uh, you know, hokey, so to speak, uh, to say to say this, but is is that in our individual friendships, we are doing that, and and we are building up, and that's that that's really, I think, a very hopeful uh, situation for people who are living an everyday life, and uh, and and aren't close to those those lovers of power. That it it, it all has to connect and start with it with individuals. But I, uh, and your, your point about de Klerk and Mandela is, uh, is a wonderful one. And uh, what uh, humility, I, I suppose that it took uh, for de Klerk to, uh, to serve as the vice president for the man he imprisoned uh, and, and oversaw his imprisonment for, for so long. Um, so um, thank you. Uh, Chris, I believe you have uh, some questions to start. Sure. Yeah, Lord Hastings, uh, your background has been very has been varied uh, in terms of profession, but it doesn't seem uh, that the themes of your interests have skipped around. 
Uh, two roles that stand out as likely connected and deal with the role of business in society. As uh, BBC's head of corporate social responsibility and KPMG's global head of citizenship, you were in a unique position to define the notion of corporate social responsibility. What do you see as the role of corporations in this, uh, the support of the common good? Well, I have a very, um, very active view of it. And I got the opportunity as a participant of the World Economic Forum to lead a particular strand of work at Davos a number of years ago, in which in my role at KPMG, we took on the challenge put down by the World Economic Forum to redefine civil society. Now, if you were to ask most people, and particularly in academic circles, what is civil society? They'd say, oh, well, that's what charities and foundations and non-governmental organizations do. They campaign and they deliver common good experiences as a result of philanthropy. Or they'd add to that agencies like the United Nations, or they'd add to that governments. And so they'd think of bilateral aid and they'd think of uh, advocacy entities. And they'd say, well, those are that's civil society. And we came with the very strong notion, which I think is a truth, that business is also the fourth leg of the pillar. You've got government, you've got non-governmental organizations, foundations and charities, and you've got global institutions like the United Nations. Those are clearly about the common good. They're clearly about civil society. But business is also about civil society. So let me just give you a very practical British example, but I know this equally applies to any country that has gone through the course of the last year and a half during the coronavirus pandemic. Here in the UK, we celebrated multiple Thursdays for months for the National Health Service, and we stood on our doorsteps and we said, thank God for the doctors and the nurses and the hotel porters and the wonderful medical provision and the ventilator supplies and so on. But we also required at the same time to be grateful for the Amazon deliveries. And we also had to be incredibly grateful for the supermarkets, whether it was Morrison's or Aldi or was Sainsbury's or Tesco's. We had to have business providing us with the electricity and the bandwidth so that we could be online on Teams or Zoom and we could do all of our world online. But we also had to have the fact of public provision to ensure that we could have health services and get vaccinated. So you have to hold the two in common parlance. You can't have you can't have a disconnected society where all the good rests in the public space and all the profit is seen as bad in the private space. Profitable organizations deliver public goods. Somebody asked me once, oh, give us an example of a good profitable organization. I said to them, could you just turn the tap on? What comes out of it? And they said, well, water. I said, where do you think that comes from? That is a privately provided profitable service. It doesn't, the government doesn't provide the water out of your taps. It, it doesn't even manage the sewage that goes through your drains. That's also privately held. So we have the public services who take our bins away, but we have the private services who take our rubbish away through the pipes. And we hold the two in tandem. Now, I'm proud of the fact that the organization that I worked for, for KPMG for 13 years, uh, as global head of citizenship, KPMG in the UK was the first of any corporate organization to make a commitment to a living wage. And there were a lot of people around the city of London who turned their noses up and they turned their eyes and what on earth are you doing that for? Because there is a government regulated, legislated minimum wage. Our argument was very simple. A living wage says that we respect the fact that there's a minimum basic, but there's also a living dignity element. And that living dignity element gives, gives workers who are at the lower rungs of the operation the opportunity to save and to develop lives for themselves and for their children. Now, once we took that step of being a city-based business that pushed and delivered the living wage throughout the business, well, then the next business did it and the next one. Now it's the law. We actually now have the living wage as accepted public and private purpose. And it was wonderful to see when the biggest retail organization in the world, which is Walmart, of course, headquartered in the United States in, in Bentonville, where I have been to see the Walmart headquarters, when the chief executive announced that Walmart would be a living wage 
business. Now, that's in the United States only. They haven't applied that everywhere, but certainly in the United States, which is their biggest place of employment, many millions of employees. So what a wonderful thing that business says this common good of fair remuneration sits with us as much as it sits with the regulations provided by legislators. I, when we can hold all of that concept together, and I tell you, when we did the work for the World Economic Forum, we published the document on the future of civil society. What was, to be completely candid, very depressing, uh, and not about the report, it was excellent. What was depressing was that the fight came to us not from business, but from the charities and NGOs, because this had been their sacred territory. And we were now saying, you're not the only ones delivering common good. We're also delivering common good. And if you want to look at any industry more than any other, and it's, this is gonna surprise you when I mention it, which delivers common civil society services in the most difficult of all locations, it is mining. The extractive mining industry has to create towns, almost cities in bizarre, out of the way locations in the Namibias and the South Africas, in the Libyas and in the, in the Mongolias and in all sorts of strange places that most of us would never end up going to in order to get the minerals and assets that most of us want for our mobile phones, let alone for our cars, let alone for the white goods in our homes. And they create entire townships of many, many tens of thousands of people with schools and hospitals and clinics and services and roads and electricity. These are commercial companies creating communities, not NGOs. And in fact, a, a study some years ago actually said, looking at the case here, and particularly in Australia, that actually the mining companies had delivered higher levels of economic benefit to low level communities than any governmental intervention had done or even NGO had done. So let's hold the thing in a common sense, common ring between Profit, profit makers and profit users. We both need to be prophetic. I, I think that's a very interesting example of, of harnessing the power of, of businesses and the market needs uh, for the, the common good. And it, it, it's a good, perhaps a good segue and perhaps you may have even answered my, my next question a bit uh, with that. Uh, it, in, the, in your leadership service, you, you've worked with a number of publicly traded companies or organizations affiliated with publicly traded companies. And a publicly traded company exists uh, both in its commitments and even legally a little bit different than other privately held companies uh, in that they have uh, duties to shareholders uh, that they, they need to keep in mind. So there is uh, sometimes seen this tension of balancing share price pressure with the growing recognition that companies need to give back to the community or to create community, and uh, I, I think perhaps in your last example, you may have you may have given a good uh, a good example of how uh, they can be compatible. But do, do you have thoughts on that 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 tension sometimes between share price pressure and community uh, needs? Well, it is a real pressure, and let's not let's not pretend that, that it's not because the shareholders of the business often are quite opaque, if not completely unknown. We will know about the individual shareholders. We'll know about the well-known shareholders. We won't know about the funds, which could be pension funds and investment funds, which are located wherever, which hold substantial share options in listed companies on the New York Stock Exchange, the Singapore Stock Exchange, the Hong Kong, the London Stock Exchange, the Frankfurt Stock. We, we have no idea about some of the people who, or some of the entities which hold and control. And if they are purely interested in short-term gains, they will buy and sell relatively quickly on the market. Now that's been a trend for basically a century, but the movement now, and it is very strong, and the Business Roundtable of America has asserted this incredibly clearly, and regulation here in the UK, corporate regulation in the UK also requires that the duty of boards in looking after the share value of companies is the duty was includes a duty towards the long-term health of the wider society. 
as well as to the long-term value of the business. Now, if you're in the petrochemicals industry, for example, the extractive oil and gas industry, uh, you, you realize that the, the general tenor of the movement of business thinking, whether it is around vehicles or around provisions, is going towards renewables. But of course, it's going to be another 40 to 50 years before we're all completely electrified in one way, shape or another. So you have to hold the two intention. The big providers, the BPs and the Shells and the, even the Exxon Mobiles have all moved towards alternative energy provision. They're all investing in renewables. And why are they doing that? Because the shareholders require the long-term health of the business. But that means that they're investing also in environmental gains in the good positive gains that the stakeholder requires. The shareholder will say, well, just get the price of oil as high as you can so we can get a higher value for our sales. But if you'll say, if the duty also says, what's the long-term share value of the business, then be ready for what 50 years will bring. And I think we, we've moved away from just that the gain was in those who held the shares. The gain is in those in the wider society's need and how that wider society's need is being presented in legislation, in regulation, but also in public opinion. I mean, we are not being required by law at the moment to buy electric vehicles, but people are en masse buying electric vehicles. And why? Because they've caught, a, caught the wind and the wind of the responsibility of the duty to enhance the life on the planet way beyond our own period of life and, and existence. Let's make sure our grandchildren, our great grandchildren have prospects that we can share in with them. And we're all wise enough now to see that as much as we want to drive what we want to drive and own what we want to own, we have a duty beyond that individual choice, which is the collective common good. Now that equally applies to market institutions. So I do think we're in a different space to where we were three, three decades ago. Four decades ago, when the duty of the shareholder was paramount, now the duty of the shareholder is shared with the stakeholder. Lord Hastings, you have been involved in the Millennium Promise, uh, which is an organization committed to alleviating poverty. Uh, and if I'm understanding its founding correctly, is partially inspired by the ideas advanced by Professor Jeffrey Sachs right. in his book, Commonwealth. Uh, in the book, he discusses the role of global coordination to alleviate poverty. Uh, could you tell us a, a bit about the, the work the organization undertook and how you saw Professor Sachs's ideas in action? Well, I think one of the, the brilliant things that Professor Sachs, dear Jeffrey Sachs, a great friend, decided to do was not just to have economically potent theory at Columbia University in New York, but was to put it into practice. So at the heart of his thinking was that if we're going to see transformation, we've got to look at it practically and geographically. So he created the concept of millennium cities and millennium villages. And there were a number of, I think it was, if I remember correctly, 16 or 18 millennium villages across sub-Saharan Africa and somewhere in the region of 10 millennium cities. Um, and what the purpose of these villages and cities was, look at an area holistically. Now, if, if you're going to put in, for example, healthcare, if you're going to provide uh, doctors and nurses and pharmaceuticals and maternity care, well, you, you need to have electrification because if a lot of pharmaceuticals, and you know, we, we're all understanding certain vaccines need minus temperatures of great extent at the moment. So you better have electrification so that you can have refrigeration. So if you're gonna provide healthcare, you need the infrastructure of electrification, you need, you need roads, you need transport support. Uh, if you're going to support schooling for girls, which was something that Jeffrey Sachs passionately committed to, well, you better have schools which have girls' toilets. You need actual practical facilities to be able to deliver high quality services of education for girls. And we found that actually one of the largest reasons why so many girls were not going to school was the absence of separate Toilets, if you want to have education, have toilets. You see, th this is the practical way you have to think about how you engineer the support of a community to do what he said very clearly, and I support it absolutely, build its confidence to be self-supporting. I remember so clearly when we were launching a, a major millennium 
from its villages network in the northeast of Ghana, six villages, uh, British government taxpayers' money at the tune of around about 20 million pounds, just short of 20 million pounds to support these six villages. Fantastic initiative uh, designed by Millennium Promise. And there was a detailed discussion with civil servants in the British government about what are, the, what are going to be the measures of success? And they had their list, which included a whole series of accountabilities and financial metrics and production this and outcomes that. He rejected every single one of them. And he said the one critical measure is confidence. Because if as a result of this expenditure, local people become confident that they can create their own economic prospects and feel free to till the land and to have electricity and to build their own schools and to do well by their families and their children, they will become effectively responsible, reliable citizens. We'll have set them free. So at the heart of Millennium Promise was we have to put these things geographically into practice, pick locations, pick tough locations, do it practically on the ground, be, be, see everything holistically, rather than just say, as I said, from the example of healthcare being the obvious one, healthcare isn't just about doctors, nurses, and pharmaceuticals, and maternity support. It's about what you need to provide it very well. And you know, one of the wonderful things I, I got to do in my role as a trustee of the Vodafone Group Foundation was to go to Ghana and uh, Ghana on another occasion to see a fascinating technical support system created by Vodafone, which was, which was going to be an ambulance recognition system for where people live. So if they called for an ambulance from their mobile phone, the electric supply system picked up a GPS signal, which then located them exactly and precisely so an ambulance could get to this poor woman who's, who's pregnant and about to, well, has gone into labor and needs support, was in the old days, they would have called for an ambulance and said, well, you know, it's the fourth road on the left after the third tree down the fourth road. And then you see the one, the tree that's hanging over and follow that one down to the bottom is a big drop. And then you go up a hill, by which point the poor woman has lost it. So again, business actively saying, let's be practical about how we deliver in, in development services. So that was Jeffrey Sachs's vision. Development services have to be holistic and practical. They have to be on the ground, but they have to see people as gaining independence, confidence, and citizenship. Well, one point that Professor Sachs keeps returning to in his work is the need for cooperation at an international level, uh, which goes without saying is, is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, do you find the challenges of cooperation at an international level to be dissimilar and in some way perhaps more difficult than the challenges faced with cooperation on a smaller scale, say in a community, a country, or a region? And also, uh, what do you see as uh, important components of building cooperation and uh, the common good on this international level? Well, uh, let me begin at the end, as you said, what, what is the priority here? And the priority here of it particularly uh, about international cooperation, especially with, through a development lens, the priority is to serve the needs of the people who need that support most acutely. So if the objective is to serve them, then all the NGOs or governmental agencies involved, whether it is the, an agency like UNICEF, which I'm a vice president, or it's, a, it's an independent NGO like World Vision, they need to collaborate with each other. It's no use UNICEF saying, we're going to go to this village in Tanzania and build a school and find that when they've arrived there, World Vision is there building a school. So they, they better prepare to look, at, to look at development needs through the lens of collaboration and partnership. I mean, everybody who has something to offer and to bring should bring it to the table. But when you bring it to the table, what has to walk away from the table is not your brand, or the reputation of your entity, but rather the service that will be provided for the cause. Now, that's why I think the sustainable development goals, which again, Jeffrey Sachs was so prominent in developing as he was with the millennium development goals. You know, these critical 17 objectives, which really essentially are all about providing dignity and services, beginning with the proposition of, millenn of sustainable development goal number one, the end of extreme poverty and hunger, which is, by the way, is meant to be by 2030. Now, if we, if we are going to achieve it, which we're not, 
by 2030. You know, we're looking at it just nine years off from the point that we're making this recording. If we if we're to look at the end of extreme poverty and hunger, we now know as a consequence of the 2020 2021 coronavirus pandemic around the world, that number of those extremely destitute, poor and hungry has actually shot up. It was heading down for the last 20 years has now gone back up by an estimated 200 million people. And just a week ago, the executive director of the World Food Program, David Beasley, a wonderful man, former governor of, uh, of, a, of a US state uh, who leads the World Food Program, the biggest NGO in the world, pointed out that an extra 41 million people this year, 2021, are also facing starvation and destitution. Now, are we gonna achieve those SDGs by 2030? No, we're not, because sadly, because of behaviors in 2020, 2021, we've kind of lost the plot on the decline. So this even more emphasizes the need for collaboration and cooperation, put common resources together and enable common resources to fight for common purposes in common locations. Um, I, at the moment, I'm just involved in a very important Vodafone global study that is looking into the decolonization of international aid. And what we mean by that is saying, there are so many costs associated with the providers of aid that those costs being held by institutions in Western countries, in other words, Western countries benefiting from the dispersal of support to, let's call it Southern countries, whether it is Latin America, parts of Asia, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of that resource is held at Western country headquarters. Now, what if we could genuinely release those resources in trust and confidence, in collaboration to the entities on the ground? Take out the bureaucratic middle men and women and make sure that the service for which we are there, the purpose for which we are there, which is to meet practical, tangible health, education, feeding, environmental, gender needs it is delivered by collaboration. Now, this goes back to our starting point at the beginning of this conversation, which is about friendship. And if, if we choose to make friends with those who have to be the frontline deliverers, those who've got to have not, not just the vision for what needs to be done, but the operation of what needs to be done, and we build confident relationships, then we can deliver so much more and more effectively. The worst figure that's going around in my head this year, 2021, is when someone, a very senior businessman, I have a great amount of trust and affection support for who understand these, understands these things very well, said, you know, because of what's happened with COVID, we may be pushing back this 2030 boundary to 2050. Oh my word. So we're even suggesting that it's gonna take longer to bring dignity opportunity, food on the table, let alone education, water services, electrification, and good housing. But if we were to collaborate between the agencies of providers, whether they're public or private or NGOs, we could deliver so much more. And that has to be the purpose and the vision. All of us in the development space need to put ourselves out of business. That, 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 that is a wonderful aspirational uh, goal. And uh, I think it relates back to uh, Lord Hastings, what you mentioned, uh, perhaps a few years ago, the shock of NGOs as businesses began to uh, take a community activism and community need seriously, uh, as, as they had to adjust to perhaps a new paradigm, well, where there was collaboration, but ultimately, exactly right, uh, this uh, it, it should go out of business, and, and uh, as, as the goal uh, with uh, alleviating poverty and, and helping to uh, folks rise. Uh, one of the points which you made, which I think is very interesting, is that uh, in the example of Ghana, the village that villages that you were describing, you, you mentioned that you needed to go to the tough places. So, and 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 that is uh, that 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 struck me as 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 very important, and and also perhaps uh, is a something which leads to a, a question that's been on my mind, and 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 might mm -hmm. even be a counter to some criticisms of. Uh, the global view of the common good and uh, also of uh, perhaps uh, some of the ideas in, in, in Commonwealth. 
that the, that the macro aspects of policy commitments by international organizations have sometimes been accused of leveling down in, in the sense of ignoring the richness of cultures and seeking a type of bland global citizenship that is merely uh, consumption oriented and, and in a trade chain. Uh, it, it, so, so in trying to deal with over seven and a half billion people, uh, some raise criticisms of forgetting the individual and forgetting local culture. Uh, but you've seen this global work up close. And it strikes me that this example of the, uh, of the villages in Ghana uh, are, is a, <laughs> might be an interesting counter to, to this criticism. Uh, it's thoughts. Well, you know, there's been, I'm, I'm very respectful of the views in the great book by Dan Bisamoyo um, called Dead Aid. And she makes the, the point that continuous aid is not ultimately the long-term way to bring comprehensive economic dignity to the poorest of all people, because we, you will just keep on feeding the endlessly open mouth. We need immediate aid when real things happen, disasters, tragedies, but but also when there is conflict and where and when there is lingering destitute poverty, you, you can't have a philosophical discussion about whether aid is needed. You need to provide the aid at that moment. Uh, it's it's a little bit like it's no point breaking your leg, going to hospital, and then them wanting to discuss what was the nature of the sport you were doing when you broke your leg. You just need it fixing. You need some help at that point rather than a debate. So we, we, need, we need an aid culture that accommodates the fact that there are still, still nearly a billion people, you know, one out of seven people on our planet do, do not know where two meals a day are coming from. And some people don't know, know where one meal a day is coming from. And they don't know where tomorrow's meal is possibly coming from, we still have the vast ongoing death figures of children under the age of six from water-based diseases. And, and let's be candid, mainly because of poisoned water, diarrhea-based tragedies. And we're talking about figures which are literally, literally, and this, you know, this is the hard fact, literally four to five times greater on an annual death rate basis than all the deaths caused in 2020, 2021 by coronavirus. And yet we, we, start, we sort of go, oh, well, and shrug our shoulders. Now, is it impossible to get clean water to every corner of the world and to all of its people? I mean, we managed to get Coca-Cola pretty well to most places in the world. Why can't we get clean water? And, and of course, that's a commercial provision. If, if we had the active collaboration of governments, commercial providers, uh, NGOs, and public and international agencies working together, we can solve these problems. But if we're going to have an argument about aid, we'll end up going around in circles and not actually delivering. We've got to be focused on the delivery. Now, when we be, when we've begun to get these tough and hard figures down from well, the figures roughly around about nine hundred. Uh, million people in destitution. Where we've got the figures down from the 900 million down towards, I mean, there's no acceptable level. Let's be candid. You can never say 200 million is an acceptable figure. There's no acceptable figure. But it needs to be on a perpetual decline. When it's on a perpetual decline, it's frankly less than 100 million. And the population is probably going to be upwards of 9 billion by that point. We can then begin to say, okay, how do we ensure the economic security of the poorest people in the world, that's going to come from business, from enterprise, from vibrant economy. It's going to come from investing in creating the qualities of talent and service. And we've seen that so evidently, the two most crystal clear countries, let alone three being, being China, India, Mexico, which have managed to do that with such freedom and across the continent of Africa, Rwanda and Botswana, increasingly Kenya and Ghana. Let's hope the rest of the continent follows suit as much as we hope the rest of Latin America follows suit by the example of Chile, for example. So can enterprise deliver social good? Abundantly so. Is it all going to happen tomorrow? No, we still need aid. But do we need investment more than aid? No, I'd say we need them in equal measure. The numbers needing aid is going up, but the numbers needing investment is going up. So let's put the two 
lots of heads together. This is where governments, you know, we've just had the G7 here in the UK, thank goodness for that, the G20 is coming up. We all know that these circles of political leaders are fantastically important for sharing ideas and conversation, but it's about time that the G7 and the G20 and the United Nations brought in the big executives of the business corporations who can deliver the services that are needed from water to infrastructure, to electrification, to medical services, to bring in the business and to bring in service providers and to bring in market providers. And that way we'll begin to achieve these great sustainable development goals. And that way we will have actually fulfilled our collaborative common good vision. Well, it, it, and I think that on, on that point, you, you made a very important point earlier, uh, which I think is overlooked in the sense that the aid that you have been discussing, sometimes uh, it ends up right back in the Western companies. So it, it, the, the aid is important, it's needed, but it sometimes reverberates right back. Uh, and, and that, that just simply strikes me if I, uh, and I believe this is what you were expressing is that that doesn't provide a long-term investment uh, in that local country. So the infrastructure that you've been talking about, and I think health is an excellent example where we, we talk about healthcare or right to healthcare, but there's, there's a lot that has to be developed in order to achieve even the most basic of that. So, so trying to understand and to target uh, it, it, perhaps I'm using sustain, going to use sustainable in a quite different way, but locally sustainable uh, businesses and infrastructure uh, that uh, that is not necessarily uh, reliant on uh, the source of the aid, so that, so that they can develop. And and, and that brings me to a, a question: as you've traveled the world many many times, and I, I I dare say there likely isn't a part of the world you haven't you haven't been to, uh, but an area that you've spent a great deal of time and energy focused on is in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, particularly as I understand in in Kenya, Zimbabwe, and and Ghana, as we've we've talked about. I, I, I've read that you're, you're, you're governor of, of a, a school in, in Kenya. Um, if, if we look at sub-Saharan Africa for a moment, what, what do you see are the main challenges uh, in sub-Saharan Africa for the, the next decade or two since you've, you, you've spent a lot, so much time thinking and, and working there? Well, there's challenges that are good and challenges that are bad. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the bad ones. <laughs> Thank God for the good. There's the inevitable challenge of the need for an effective governance and leadership culture, which is found in some of Africa's countries, Botswana, uh, Tanzania to a certain extent, Ghana, uh, uh, Kenya, and of course in Rwanda. And there are other countries which are beginning now to follow a, a better, more enhanced democratic route. Um, we know we're still witnessing, sadly, the corruption outcomes of South Africa and the uncomfortable mess that remains the governance of Zimbabwe and the consequences of what was the Arab Spring in the north of Africa with unsettled countries and communities. So it's, it's a mix and match, I'm afraid, across the continent. Some great examples, some dreadful ones. It, it's worth remembering before we in Western countries poke, poke, poke and point that we've also seen in the course of the last year insurrections in Washington. We've seen that what citizens will do when they want to take different areas of control and power. And th those kind of um, storming of ca the capital reduces our ability in Western countries, even including the way the government here in the United Kingdom has behaved towards the respectful necessity of the 44 years of European Union membership. There was too much um, deceitful statement and dismissiveness. Now that doesn't lead to the collaborative culture that is needed to develop effective democracy. And I would say that you know one of the challenges for, for Africa is a challenge for us, which is high quality, intelligent, integrity-laden leadership. 
you know, we're showing that we don't have it as much as we're often accusing them that they don't have it. But there's enough good examples, thank goodness, that across the continent of Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, we can point to to say, thank goodness for their positive peace-based efforts. And Egypt is a good example of that, positive peace-based efforts to go towards the future, not to hang on to the past. That's, you know, that's an uncomfortable challenge. What's a great positive? This is the year 2021 that under the tutelage and guidance of the African Union, the vast majority of the continent's countries have agreed to a free trade exchange. So now the African Union is leading what is essentially the EU of Africa, a, a common goods area for trade and for services, which allows goods to trade between countries. In fact, one of the great embarrassments of the last few decades was that as trade began to develop from many of Africa's countries, the places it was not trading was literally across to the neighbor next door or across to the three or four other countries nearby. It was all coming up to the West, but it wasn't going to the East or the South. So that new move by the African Union to build effectively a common market, a common trading area launched in 2021 is a fantastic achievement. What it also brings with it is the opportunity for Africa's countries to develop the, their own manufacturing potential. Now let's remember that you know, we, we, we leisurely use things like Swiss chocolate or Belgian chocolate. Well, show me the cocoa in Switzerland or in Belgium. It doesn't exist. Um, and you know, Italian coffee. Well, show me the coffee in Italy. It doesn't exist. We're extracting Africa's assets and reproducing them in Europe and selling them at vast prices and gaining the benefit ourselves. Well, thank goodness now Africa's countries can get the benefit of their cocoa and their coffee. And the same should apply to their minerals and their oil and their gas. So these are big positive steps forward. The African countries themselves are collaborating and becoming economically effective. The downside challenge, we've got to get better democratic principles and rule of law embedded, but there is good movement towards that and good example towards that. I am an Africa enthusiast and optimist, as long as you're prepared to wait a good long time. And I am. Well, and that, and that is, uh, I think that's a very important point because these, these changes, which are so important, uh, they, they don't come overnight. Uh, they, they have to be cultivated and, and also uh, as, as, a, as an educator cultivated in, in youth and, and in, in, in the students as they, as they mature. Um, we want to be respectful of your time. Um, so we, we, we only have a couple more quick questions for you. But uh, one is, uh, it, 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 it goes to what you were just mentioning about uh, leadership and example. And, and uh, this is also your, uh, your role with Huntsman. Uh, school in, in your professorship of, of leadership. Uh, sitting in the Lords, you are a member of the legislature of one of the most powerful countries in the history of the world. And, and your decisions not only shape the law here in the UK, but, but they impact the world, sometimes directly uh, in, in the votes and the legislations, but at a minimum, always as an example of civil parliamentary debate and deliberation, or what we hope is, is civil. <laughs> uh, and, and what, what do you say, right? Um, we could talk about collaboration and cooperation in, in the Lords, <laughs> if, if, if you want. Uh, but uh, one of the things, you've, you've been in the Lords now uh, 16 years uh, or thereabouts. Uh, what, do you, what do you see are the strengths of the Westminster system in shaping law for the common good that, that set an example? For, for the world? Well, just take the day on which we're doing this conversation. Uh, the prime minister has had to be questioned as he is every single week in the House of Commons by constituency MPs. And then this afternoon has also been questioned by what's called the liaison committee of the House of Commons. Now, I, re I remember a very well-known international president, head of a government when I pointed out to this person that they, that they had never been seen in their parliament more than once in a year, that the British prime minister has to be present once every week and sometimes more than once every week. I do think the Westminster system really does enshrine and enforce accountabilities. Ministers, secretaries of state can be summoned 
because a question is put down by an elected member, which the Speaker of the House of Commons or the Speaker of the House of Lords takes as a question that must be answered, an urgent notice question that day, Minister has to drop what they're doing. They might have thought they're going off on a jolly with a foreign whatever, but no, they are required in Parliament. Now, that doesn't happen in the United States. The secretaries of state uh, of different uh, departments of the US government cannot be called at an instant to Congress or to the Senate. It doesn't happen, in fact, anywhere else, apart from the countries which have followed the Westminster model, for which I would point out Australia and Canada, New Zealand, and many of the Caribbean countries have followed that model. So the advantage of the system is genuine accountability. Uh, but one thing it requires, in addition to accountability, is that those who are going to be asking the questions and making the points need to also be persistent in their demands to get answers that are rigid and not just accept what is said to them at an instant. You know, it's, it's the art of government is often said to be, you don't answer the question you're asked, you tell the statement you've already pre-made. Well, that's not good enough. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have the opportunity to do both in the House of Laws and the House of Commons is literally bounce up uh, under normal circumstances and require the minister to answer the question. And when he doesn't answer or she doesn't answer the question, somebody else gets up and says, no, answer the question. Here's the question again, answer the question. Go to the detail. And one of the requirements of the system is if the minister doesn't answer the question from what we call the dispatch box, they have to write to the elected or unelected member and place a copy of the letter in the library of the house. So accountability is the benefit of the system. Second thing I would say is that we have expansive debate on themes and issues which are not legislation, because not all of Parliament is about lawmaking. An awful lot of Parliament is about thinking, and thinking is incredibly important. A law might come further down the line, but what's necessary is just to air the issues the public want to think about and talk about. And they may be very difficult and uncomfortable issues, but they need to be discussed. Days of remembrance, times of recognition, themes and issues the public are agonizing over, picking up on on what's the underbelly of society's troubles and debating them so that thoughts can be formed and government can be better and more effective at delivery. And then I think the third thing is that our system is open to full public engagement and the public can en engage with their elected member at any point they wish to do so. And when it comes to the House of Lords, of course, it's different because we're not there as constituency members. We're there for the purpose of revision of legislation and also for constitutional reasons, but we can still be contacted by the public, as I am, and people will send you their thoughts and perspectives, and we can read them, absorb them, and sometimes reflect them in debate and in law. So it gives us, uh, I suppose, the way to wrap it up is a closeness to the nerve of the people that you'll find in any other elected system. And as a, a closing question, uh, as you noted in your opening, uh, the, the notion and the idea of the common good is by no means new, but uh, we do see seem to be uh, having a little bit of a revival in, in the term. Uh, and certainly we see a great deal of interest in the common good in our students. Uh, we have just finished the academic year and many students are leaving university to begin their careers. Uh, Lord Hastings, as someone who dedicated your career to the common good, what is your advice to students who are seeking deep meaning and fulfillment in their careers? Well, I have two very simple pieces of advice. Number one is you need to know by the time you leave university, I mean, in fact, you should know before you start, but you need to know what your purpose in life is going to be, not what your job is going to be, not what your career path is going to be, what your purpose in life is going to be, what, what do you want to focus on that is of significance and of dignity that has an impacting and legacy-based value. When I was 16 years old, I was asked by one of my best friends at school, a very important question, Michael, what will you do with the rest of your life? What do you want to be known for? And I said, here it comes, I said it at 16. I've said it every year since 16. I said, I want to speak for the poor and I want to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. So everything I've done has been about that. And when you have a purpose, and you know what it is, and you can define it and spell it out and say it, 
you can anchor your life around the purpose. So I say to every student, you, you've got to find the purpose. And they say, oh, I don't know what to do. I'll say to them, listen, look at the 17 sustainable development goals. You will see the whole world in there. Choose one and focus on it and do something effective. You could then go on to be an extremely lucrative and, and well-renumerated banker in the city of London or anywhere else, but you can still be focused on protecting the oceans. There's not a clash with your job. You could become a barrister or a lawyer as a consequence of your career, of your academic studies, but you can still be absolutely focused on gender equality. You, you have to have a purpose, which is a good, and live by it. That's the first thing I'd say. Second thing I'd say, choose, choose to go visit places in the world that are not holiday destinations. Everybody who just goes and lies on beaches and goes to nightclubs and casinos is wasting their life. Choose instead to live by looking for places of curiosity and interest. Go visit places of historical significance where major events took place. Go see communities who are poor and destitute and broken and go see communities of people who are still indigenous and different. Discover that there is a world way beyond your entertainment. And as you discover that, your wholeness as a human being will be greatly enhanced, if not realized for the first time. Well, thank you. I, I don't think it, it, Chris or I could improve on that advice that you've just given. It's, it's very beautiful in many ways. Uh, thank you. And uh, on behalf of the students who may be listening, I, I hope they take your advice to heart. So Lord Hastings, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an honor to spend time with you and to learn more about your career and your thoughts and uh, your very energetic uh, passions for, uh, for the community and for the common good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.